Thanks, Ali. Uh, just a little bit of background on this. We are supporting uh, several of these emerging topics for the pooled fund study. Um, and, and we start out with, with finding out what it is that the members of the pool fund study are interested in and uh, what sorts of, of uh, information they have on a given topic. So they provide us some information to get started with. We do some, some research in, into that, uh, develop a white paper for, for the pool fund study. And, and then after that, we develop a, uh, a fact sheet and and this uh, presentation. So the fact sheet and the presentation will be available online through FHWAA or the pool fund study. And uh, uh, so as we go through each of these, there'll be a, a body of information about these different topics. Next slide, please. So this first topic deals with the, the challenges that DOTs and operating agencies have when they look at how are they going to uh, find out about incidents that are outside of their uh, coverage areas for their TMSs or their TMCs. Uh, and, and so there's, there's things that, that occur. Uh, some of the challenges include that, that whether it's a, a public safety access point or TMC operators themselves, they, they can't really quickly and accurately locate incidents or any stranded motorists that are outside of their, their coverage area. Um, monitoring capabilities simply are not available. There's no cameras, there are no detectors. And generally, uh, outside of the existing coverage areas, to add any devices is pretty costly a lot because of communication, uh, but also the devices themselves, and then also the ongoing O&M that would, that would be uh, included in having those devices outside of that coverage area. Uh, and, and, and so it's really difficult to get any accurate inf information on the, on the incidents, both the locations and any sort of details to know how to respond. And so this, this is a problem uh, across many uh, agencies around the country. Uh, also, even if it's called in by the motorist, they may not know their location. Uh, I, I used to work in a TMC and uh, we did have some callers call us directly, but even when they didn't, even when they called into uh, the, the 911 centers, it was very difficult for those dispatchers to really know where those those uh, callers were coming from, and and so it takes a while to uh, be able to to get a reasonable response together. There's a lot of uncertainty. It adds time, uh, and and then also, especially if you're outside of some of the more built up urban areas, uh, cell coverage might be real spotty. And there may also be drop calls in that, even if somebody is able to get through, uh, getting disconnected is, is not uncommon. Next sl slide, please. So existing mes methods include things like field reports that might be received through uh, a 911 center. Uh, and, and that's probably the most common one. Uh, and, and even though these calls occur pretty quickly, it's not always uh, an immediate notification from the 911 center to the TMC to get some of the uh, uh, response that DOTs need to lead uh, going. Um, and, and, and also uh, there's the problem with the, the people who call in not really knowing where they are. Uh, some of the there are some mobile applications like Waze that people can can report that there's something going on where they are. Uh, there's also social media platforms, uh, but it, but again, it it may take a while to get that information and especially know what's really going on in those in those areas, even through uh, Waze and and other 
uh, kinds of citizen reporting or social media platforms. There are some ways that can help to get better location. And the, certainly the reference mile markers are, are better. That helps uh, people, if they can see it, uh, get an idea of, of where they might be. Uh, but many times uh, there may not be any mile markers, especially not the, not the more accurate ones that, that go down to a tenth of a mile or, or two tenths of a mile. Uh, but also they might just not be able to see it. Even at a tenth of a mile, it might be difficult uh, to see where those are located. Um, and then a lot of times, especially if the if the motorist is the one who's who's involved and it's uh, a more remote area, there there may not be a lot of people who who pass by. And so those people who are involved might be uh, a little bit excited and and may not be uh, able to, really think very well as they as they call in and, and answer questions. Uh, there's been uh, some unmanned aircraft systems, but but there again, that can really help provide information about the incident, but it doesn't help to uh, determine where that that crash or that incident has been located. Um, once up in the air over the, the site, there's a lot that they can do though, and there's a lot of information that, that can be that can be garnered from that. And then um, finally, there's the automatic crash notification or advanced automatic crash notification that are uh, in, in vehicles that have that, those devices and that can provide an awful lot of information. Uh, it can be automatically done through uh, the airbag deployment, uh, but but there again, there's only a, a small percentage of the vehicles that are that are uh, out on the roadway that that may have that. So it's really important to think about how else can we get that kind of information. Next slide, please. So uh, the we we looked at several different approaches to try and get information uh, or, or get accurate locations of, of uh, uh, incidents outside of, of the TMS coverage area. But, but the one that really uh, we settled on and, and we had heard a pretty good success with are direct text messaging with, with travelers. So what that is, is it's, it's software it works concurrently with a TMS or a 911 center. Uh, and there's, there's call taking involved. So uh, some of the things about that, it, at least the back end software has to be purchased so that the, the systems are in place. I think we'll hear about that later from uh, people who actually use this. Uh, and we'll be able to, to say what their experiences were with the software. Uh, and, and depending on, on what the vendor is that has the software, there's usually some sort of a toolbar, uh, some way to, to kind of float on top of, if you will, the, the CAD or the call taking interface so that, so that uh, call takers can see what that is and, and be able to take these, these actions. Uh, and the toolbar will be idle in, until, it's, until it's clicked. Now, the people who take the calls uh, will, will take it from an inbound caller from their, from their phone, and they will then uh, ask the, the caller uh, if it's okay to access their smartphone through a text message. So they'll send them a text message, say, can, can we get uh, access to your smartphone? That will help us locate where you are and, and get you help as quickly as possible. Then those callers click on the link that's uh, in that text message to, pro to provide that permission to access their, their smartphone. So uh, there are specific things that, that they access, that, the GPS coordinates, speed, sometimes camera images or or video, they can request that as well. Uh, and that can help especially to to see a little bit better what uh, the first responder may uh, maybe uh, need to be prepared for. 
Uh, and they they can also get kind of the closest building address, at least an an, an estimate of that. And and the smartphone information can be saved and shared with responders to improve that incident response time. Uh, so this is this is can, can be done with no uh, additional software, no application on the on the cell phone. And there are some uh, systems that do require at least a small download on on that smartphone. Next slide, please. So the the benefits, I, I think some of them are are pretty clear. Uh, it can really reduce the time to locate incidents. So if there's a caller calling in and you can access that that location, that provides a pretty accurate location. Uh, and it, and the other thing is that they can in, instead of having to talk to the caller all the time, they can text the the caller. So this is especially important if, uh, the call might drop. So instead of trying to reinitiate a call, the text message will just go through uh, asking for more information. And there can be a dialogue through text instead of just through voice. Uh, it also can provide uh, images, video, um, if there's consent with the motorist. That helps both in location and in specific direction of, of of travel, and so that helps uh, dispatching the required resources re to respond to the to the incident. Um, excuse me. It it doesn't take an awful lot of time uh, to deploy this. It's there's there's a little bit of of software at the back end that has to be installed. Generally, about a two month installation period. So it's 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 pretty quick to do that. Um, it also leverages the, the traveler-owned smartphone devices, so that reduces agency need to implement uh, any sort of point-based technologies, detectors, or anything else. It is important to note, though, that if there, is, if there are images or any information that is collected, uh, how the, the agency has to think about what's data retention. Do you, do you retain it at all? Um, you know, what would the specific uh, uh, policy be on that so that you're not caught kind of by surprise if there's if there's any requests for that or if there's anything else that, that might come up about that data about that data retention. Uh, next slide, please. So what what these systems uh, really try to get at and the outcomes are, again, probably not very surprising uh, considering the discussion so far, but it's to identify incidents more quickly and more accurately, and then to provide medical treatment more quickly um, because there would be more known information about where the incident is, what direction of, of travel it's involved in, and perhaps a little bit better information at the beginning if medical treatment is needed at all. Uh, it also will help uh, to reduce the time to clear because uh, responders can get there more quickly and take care of the incident more quickly, and then of course clear it more more quick more quickly as well. This also helps operators because more information is coming in. They don't have to continue to have conversations about what's happening. Um, instead, they're they're able to get the information more accurately, more quickly, and so they can continue to. Uh, respond to and manage the response to the incident in, uh, more effectively and, and provides them uh, more time to do some of those, those other aspects of their job. Uh, also, this is relatively low capital uh, and very low operations and low maintenance costs because they don't have to have uh, any sort of new field devices. Uh, next. Slide, please. So there are some key issues to, to think about. Um, it means that there has to be a caller 
uh, there has to be a, a, someone who answers the calls. So there has to be an operator that can take the call and, and then they also have to get permission from the caller to remotely access their phone. Uh, the systems that have done this have found that the users are, are pretty happy to uh, allow uh, the system to uh, get that information from their phones because they're calling in anyway. Uh, and, and having that, that request generated by the, 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 the user, there's usually not an issue with providing this information uh, at, at all. Um, but again, it's really important to think about any of the images or, or video or any of the data that might be saved, and there may be some changes needed to policies. It also requires someone, usually a TMC, to be able to accept calls from the travelers or to be able to have pretty close coordination with uh, a, a 911 center who thinks that this is a, a, a good system to have and it doesn't add too much uh, additional workload on their uh, call takers. Uh, but uh, there can be some, uh, some, some delay if there's not some sort of automatic way to get the information to the TMC to make sure that the uh, incidents can be responded to accurately and correctly and in a, in a coordinated manner uh, across all of the, the agencies that are involved. Um, and it does require some driver action. So it's it's not ideal for, for certain situations, like if there's uh, a, a driver that loses consciousness or are otherwise not able to, to make the call, uh, if, if there's anything that would in, inhibit their ability to, to, to make the call. One of the things though, is even if they can't speak because of the text acts, uh, aspect of it, they could at least text information and an awful lot of information can get, uh, uh, transferred, uh, through the, the, the text message aspect. And, and then, um, uh, if the vehicles are are uh, in an area where there's not good good enough cell coverage, even for text messaging, that can be a problem. Uh, but but also, if the vehicles can't be seen uh, from the roadway, it could be really difficult because even if they have a pretty accurate location. Uh, as responders come by, if they can't see where the vehicle is, it, it can slow their re response down quite a bit. And with, with that, um, are we taking questions now or, or should uh, we just pass it on?